and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be discussing the Lovas Local Lemma. Before we do that, let's situate the context. So oftentimes in the probabilistic method, we want to show an outcome happens with positive probability. So far, we've usually showed the outcome happens with high probability. So a question that's somewhat natural, is there a common situation where an outcome might happen with low but positive probability. So I want to pause and think for a moment, how might this arise? Well, there's a very natural instance, namely when you're interested in the intersection of many independent events. So for example, if a1 up to an are independent events with probability p, say greater than zero, then of course the intersection of all of those events is p to the n as their independence, the product, and that'll be greater than zero. But this would be uh, exponentially small, right? If p is, say, a half, you're going to get 1 over 2 to the n. It would be very, very small, but still a positive probability. And here we've proved that it's actually positive. And so the question is, does this still hold if the events are mostly independent? So that would be quite natural. Maybe we don't have independence, but maybe we have somehow mostly independent events. And then this would be a nice outcome to have and differ from the high probability type proofs we've done before. So let's try to formalize this. How do you formalize being mostly independent? Well, there's a nice notion of mutual independence. So we say an event A in a probability space is mutually independent of a set B of other events if for every subset of B, call that S, the probability of A conditioned on uh, the events in S, so those are B, I say, the, all of them happening, is equal to the probability of A. So really this means that no matter which events in B happen and which don't, the probability of A remains the same. So that's quite nice, it's, it's mutual independent. So event A is mutually independent of all this set of events. And we'll just note that an event may be pairwise independent to each event in B, but not mutually independent. So it's important to understand mutual independence uh, as a generalization of pairwise. So pairwise isn't enough, to imply mutual independence. For example, uh, you can consider the following uh, example, that x1 up to xk are integers 1 to n, uh, say k is at least 3, and you require the sum to be odd. Now you might not think of that as a probability space, but it is, I mean, it's a subset of events here. And then what are, uh, what are the outcomes, what are the events we'd be interested in? So if you take the events ai where xi is odd, so think about that. So, you know, we have this global condition that the sum is odd, uh, but, you know, we look at the event that each xi is odd. So those will be pairwise independent. If you take any two of them and k is at least three, uh, it doesn't really matter. There's no condition. Uh, the global condition doesn't affect them. So indeed, they'll be pairwise independent, but one is not mutually independent of the rest because of this global condition. Once I... Uh, know the outcomes of all the other events, whether I know the other xi's are odd or even, then it forces the remaining xi uh, to be indeed uh, odd or even, depending on the parity. So that's an important thing to understand. So this idea of mutual independence, that I'm somehow independent of any subset, no matter what happens in that set B, whether which events are on or off, uh, then the probability remains the same. All right, so now we've formalized kind of mostly independent, we will do this with this idea of mutual independence. And now we can kind of state the Lovas local lemma. So here's the informal version. The Lovas local lemma shows that if a set of bad events, so we're trying to avoid these, that are mostly mutually independent, so mostly uh, we'll get to formalizing in a bit, and that they happen with low probability, and we'll say what low would have to be there, uh, then with positive probability, none of them happen. So normally when you do the Lovas local lemma, when you apply it, you think of uh, these events as being bad events that you'd like to avoid, and then with positive probability, none of them happen. So instead of taking the intersection of, of the complements there and showing they happen, here we avoid them and we think probability none of them happen. Uh, and that's just for use in the formula, as you'll see. All right, so that's the informal version. Uh, then how are we gonna do this? We're gonna actually have two versions. 
Uh, and I'll also note that this was proved by Lovas. It actually appeared in a paper of Erdos and Lovas in 1975. Uh, but Erdos gives Lovas the credit as the one who actually uh, came up with it. But you can reference their paper. But so now on to the version. So we'll focus on two versions in this talk, uh, in this lecture. So the symmetric version, where probabilities and tendencies are uniformly bounded. So somehow each happens, each is upper bounded by the same probability. Each has somehow the same upper bound of the dependencies. And that's quite natural to happen if you think of these events as somehow being all the same, being symmetric. And a general version where you can allow the probabilities and dependencies to vary, uh, which is also quite useful. And so let's go to those versions. So let's start with the symmetric version. How do we formalize? So we're almost there. So here's the Lovas local lemma symmetric version. Suppose A and we'll, is a set here, A1 up to AN is a set of events in an arbitrary probability space. So for every I and N, we're going to suppose two things, that there exists a DI subset of A with DI at most D, such that AI is mutually independent of all the remaining events of A minus DI. So that's how we quantify mostly. So if you're mutually independent of a set of all but D events. So that's uh, the DI there. And then we're also going to assume that the probabilities are small. So the probability of AI is at most P. So here's the uniformly bounded. So we're using the same D uh, for each uh, event for the mutual independence and the same P as an upper bound for the probability. And now that doesn't say anything yet because of course, I haven't really told you what P and D are or how they're related. And so here's that. We're going to assume that EP times D plus one is at most one. And what is E there? That's the actual number E. Uh, 2.7 blah. So if uh, if we have this, which really is saying that p is small, so if p is at most 1 over e d plus 1, where d is that uh, dependency bound, then we'll actually conclude that the probability that none of the events happens is strictly greater than zero, so is positive. So this is the quote symmetric version. We can indeed ensure that none of the bad events, uh, these AIs, happen as long as the probabilities are small in terms of this dependency. So one thing I'd like to point out again here, which people often um, miss, is that you know what you're independent of, what set you're mutually dependent of, isn't necessarily uh, unique. It isn't necessarily crystal clear. So if you're working somehow the events depend on variables and you say, okay, I'll take all the set of events that depend on variables that my event doesn't depend on, uh, the so-called variable model, then that makes sense. Uh, and that would be unique, but in general not. So you can think of the example from the previous slide. Uh, it's not it's maybe so clear what the independence of the things uh, should be. So we're not mutually independent of all the other events, but we're mutually independent in the previous one of, for, of all but one, but we're allowed any of those choices with that global condition. So that's just a point. So you really, when you're applying the local lemma, you should really be careful to specify what the DAI is and not just think, oh, I'm you know, pairwise independent to these events, so I'm mutually independent to all. We've already shown that that doesn't make any sense. So really you should say what the DI is and then check that this probability conditions uh, hold. All right, so that's the symmetric version. What about the general version? So we have the same setup where you have these event, the bad events a1 up to an, and now we'll tweak it a bit. So for every i, we'll have a di, but I won't tell you the size. So that's the key. I, I allow it to, to vary. Each di could be of different sizes. And to that end, I'll, I'll modify the probabilities. So how do we do that? Well, you tell me that for every i, that there's an xi from 0 up to 1, but strictly less than 1 where the probability of AI is at most XI times the product of one minus XJ, where that ranges over uh, the things that it's uh, somewhat dependent on in that, in that D set there. So that's the key is that somehow we can find an, a choice of these uh, variables XI so that all the probabilities satisfy uh, that equation. So that your at most your own value times kind of the product over the set that we're not claiming mutual dependence over. And then if we do all that, then we claim that we get the outcome we want, that none of the events happen with positive probability. In particular, you can actually show an explicit bound of the product of the one minus Xi's, uh, which will often, as you see, if the Xi's are real constants, would be kind of exponentially small as a guarantee, uh, but still nice. 
So that's the, the local lemma, the general version. We're showing that indeed it happens, but maybe with a somewhat exponentially small probability. So it's not clear, you know, algorithmically, if I tried to, to find this, that I could do that efficiently, uh, but indeed we can show it exists. All right, so now for the rest of the VET lecture, we'll uh, proceed to prove these symmetric and general versions. So we'll start with proving the symmetric from the general. So if D is zero, then there's, you're mutually independent of everything else, so I mean, the events are independent, and the result would just follow uh, directly. So then that's good, uh, but just by independence. So we may assume D is at least one, and then for every I and N, uh, we let Xi be defined to be one over D plus one. So this is the magic. We have to pick these Xi to apply the general. So we'll set it to be one over D plus one, where D is that dependency factor. And now we just have to check that the general uh, conditions hold. So why? Well, for every D at least one, we know that one minus one over D plus one to the D is at least one over E. So you can check that, uh, but indeed it's a bound. And then, so when we go to calculate xi times the product of these 1 minus xj's, uh, that's going to be at least uh, 1 over d plus 1, uh, 1 minus 1 over d plus 1 to the d. Why? Because each uh, di uh, is size at most d. So that's where you know, we have a greater than equal there. And from our equation above, that right-hand term is at least 1 over e, so you get 1 over e d plus 1, which is at least p by assumption, and that's at least the probability of AI, again, by assumption. So indeed, the conditions of the general uh, local lemma hold, and now we can find that indeed the probability is at least, so you'd actually find the, a, a real lower bound here of one minus one over D plus one to the nth, greater than zero. So exponentially small, but still uh, strictly positive. So that's how you get the symmetric from the general. That's where the E pops out, because you're somehow taking this product, this 1 minus 1 over d plus 1 to the d, can be lower bounded with e, uh, and actually Shearer showed that you really can't replace e with anything smaller uh, in the symmetric version of the local lemma. All right, so on to the general. So we've done that work, pretty easy to derive. Now the general is nice, it's a very nice proof, um, but it's going to take some bit of effort. So to that end, uh, just for notational purposes, for t as a subset of n, let not t be the intersection of all the uh, not aj's in uh, where j is in t. And then the key to proving the general version is a claim. And here's the nice claim. For every i in n, an s subset of n minus i, so every subset of, of the other events, uh, the probability of ai conditioned on not s we claim is at most xi. So we know that probability of ai was at most this xi times that product. We're going to claim that uh, whenever you condition on not s, for any other set S, that it's always at most the Xi itself. So that'll be quite nice. So how will we prove this? Well, once we have this claim, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to derive the general version quite easily, but we have to prove the claim. So how do you prove the claim? Uh, well, the key is that we're gonna go by induction on the size of this S. So really it's just a nice inductive proof. It's very slick. It's true for S is equal to zero, that's the base case. Why? Because then I'm conditioning on nothing. So uh, then we know the probability of AI is at least XI times that product. And those are most ones, so you get at most XI and you're just done there. So we may assume that S is non-empty. And now I'm gonna divide up this S, this thing we're conditioning on into two sets. So we're gonna have the ones kind of in the dependency set, so we'll have S1 be the J and S, where S AJ is in DI, and S2 be the remainder. So the ones that I, I'm claiming are mutually independent. So I'll be mutually independent of S2. So we have the set that I'm mutually independent of, S2, and S1 being the ones that we have some dependency with. All right, so now that we have that, uh, then we can break down this probability of AI conditioned on not S in, in a clever way. So if you know about conditional probabilities, this would actually be equal to the probability of AI uh, intersect not S1, conditioned on not S2, the remainder there, over the probability of not S1 conditioned on not S2. Uh, and if you just rearrange the equation, you would, you would see that it, indeed, because probability of A conditioned on B times probability of B conditioned on C would equal probability A intersect B conditioned on C. 
So we have that, and now I have to bound the numerator and denominator uh, to prove the claim. So let's go through this. So let's start with the numerator. So the probability that AI intersect not S1 conditioned on not S2, well, that's just at most the probability of AI conditioned on not S2. So who cares about also having not S1 hold? Throw that away and just look at probability A1 conditioned on not S2. Since I'm mutually independent of S2, who cares whether we're not S2 or not? Namely, the probability of AI conditioned on not S2 would just be the probability of AI, which is at most Xi times this product of the 1 minus Xj's uh, by assumption. So that's the numerator, and so maybe now you see where we're going, we have to show that the denominator is at least that product. So let's go through that. So to this end, we'll suppose that S1 is J1 up to Jr. So we're just going to enumerate, uh, label the, the elements of that set. And now the key is that we need to, to bound this probability of null S1 given null S2. How do we do that? Well, you can do a telescoping product. So we can write this as the probability of not AJK uh, conditioned on not all of the smaller things, uh, union S2. So somehow we'll start writing off, we'll say, okay, so this will be probability of AJ1 conditioned on not S2, then probability of AJ2 conditioned on not AJ1 and not S2, and so on. So you write a, a telescoping product here. And now we can simply rewrite this as 1 minus the probability uh, of AJK conditioned on those, those not of the earlier events and the S2s. And so we get this product of 1 minus probabilities. And now we're almost done. We claim that this is at least the product of 1 minus XJK, where K goes from 1 to R, which will be at least the product uh, of 1 minus XJ, where the Js are in the dependency set. Why? Because these, this S1 is a subset of the dependency set, so taking the product of 1 minus x is there, that's at least the product of just doing it over the whole set. And you'll note that we used induction here. So where do we use the induction? We used it on the probability of AJK conditioned on that naught, that that's at most XJK. And so since there's a negative there, you'll have an at least. And how does that work? Well, the set that we're conditioning on there is, uh, the naught that we're doing is, these JLs, where L is less than K, union S2, uh, and that will be uh, strictly less than S, right? So we're conditioning, we're, we're always using at least one event in S, uh, and so then we're actually conditioning on something that's smaller than S, which by induction uh, then holds. So it's a nice clever trick, uh, and then we're, we're just done. So we have that the probability of AI conditioned on all S we know that the, the, we wrote it as this numerator and denominator. Uh, the numerator we upper bounded because we just forgot about uh, the S1s and then the S2s and just had the probability of AI. The, new, uh, the denominator we were able to lower bound with this product as well. The two products will cancel and we'll get XI. So that's the proof of the claim, now finished. And now we can finish the general proof. So once you know that conditioning on, on any, uh, not on, on any set of, uh, other events uh, doesn't it has the probability upper bounded by these xi's then we can just proceed to finish the proof so namely we can write the probability of the intersection of all the ai's of the non ai's their complements uh, as equal to the product it's the same idea as we saw on the last side so you write it as the product i equal one to n of the probability of ai conditioned on not for all the smaller ones so you'd have probability of not A1, and then probability of not A1 conditioned, not A2 conditioned on not A1, not A3 conditioned on not A2 and A1, and so on. And why is that good? Well, now you see, right, that we can write this as 1 minus the probability uh, of the AIs conditioned on the not, and sorry for the typo there, there should be, uh, should be probability of AI. Uh, and then by our claim, we know that this is, uh, always, again, sorry for the typo, there's an overline there, is going to be at most xi. And so then we're done because we'll have that this is at least the 1 minus xi's as the product. Uh, and so that will conclude our, our, our very nice proof of the general uh, version of the local lemma. So again, somehow the key is showing, uh, is the doing these telescoping products and using them inductively uh, to conclude 
with these xi, these general bounds. Uh, and then we knew, of course, since the xi are less than one, then that product is indeed at least positive as desired. So that concludes our proof of the local lemma. So we've done the statements, we've done the proof. Next time we'll look at applying the local lemma. So the Lovas local lemma is one of the foundations of probabilistic combinatorics. It's very useful, has many, um, many applications. Uh, we're just going to look at a couple of them next time, uh, but it's key. But today we, we went through the statement, gave some intuition as to how it works, and then went through a, a formal proof as that is good to see. So until next time, see you then.